Now, if I am awake, you should all be awake. What a very special joy it is for me to return to this beautiful nation. One year ago, I was initiated. And you've been in my heart ever since. I count it a special privilege, and I'm grateful to the conference officers for the invitation to come back again to be with you. Already I've seen many of my friends, even some from the South Island, and I look forward to meeting more of you and sharing. I talked with my dear wife yesterday, Jacqueline. You remember that I call her Fudge because she's brown and sweet. <laughs> I talked with her yesterday and I said, now, sweetheart, because we have a pact that whenever I, away from her serving, she prays when I begin to speak. And I said, now, dear, you will have to add 19 hours to whatever time it is in Dallas. Then you will know when to pray. And so, it is now Friday afternoon at 4.36. And, uh, is that right? Yes. She's praying. Praise the Lord. All this week, I will be sharing with you messages about the Christian's power through Jesus Christ to conquer and be conquerors. Let me just share the key text for the week. And uh, then you'll be comfortable with what we'll be doing each evening from Romans, the eighth chapter, beginning with verse 35. This is not my sermon today, but this is the overall theme for the week, beginning with verse 35 of Romans the eighth chapter. I hear the pages are still rustling. I'll wait a moment. You're going to find all week that I'll spend a lot of time sharing the Word of God. I mean actually reading it. For in recent years of my ministry, the Spirit of God has pointed out to me that what God has to say is far more important than what any man should say. And so it gives me strength to read his word. And I hope that that strength will be shared by you. Follow as I read. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors, through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We have every reason this morning to be encouraged. We have every reason this morning to take heart. 
We have every reason to be the happiest people on the top side of the earth because Jesus is our champion. Now, I want you to get happy out here. Now, I want you to say amen every now and then. Don't let the Cook Islanders outdo you. <laughs> if I tell the truth, say amen. If I don't, pray for me. I look forward to sharing this week with you. Let me give you a little preview. Let me show you something. Uh, Monday night, conquering temptations. You want to know about that. You can do it through Jesus. Tuesday night, conquering guilt. I know. You lug around a huge weight of guilt all the time when long since God has forgiven you and set you free and you're still lugging it around. Be out here on Tuesday night. We're going to conquer guilt through Jesus. Wednesday night, conquering worry. Anybody here worried? Uh, I know you're worried. You're worried about the wrong things. So come on out and let's share victory through Jesus. Then, conquering discouragement. I'm on the wrong night, by the way. I'm a night early. That would be Wednesday. Then, conquering discouragement. You know, I actually believe that when the Christian is discouraged, he is bordering on sin. What business have you being discouraged when you already know how the story is going to come out? You ever read a good book and get anxious for the ending and you turn to the end of the book to see how it's going to come out and you cheat a little bit? Well, praise God, you've got a book that tells you how it's going to come out. If you just go to the last book, you know that we will end up being victorious and conquerors. So why are you discouraged? Well, you come on out. Jesus is going to fix that for you, too. Then, conquering fear. Conquering handicaps. Conquering inconsistency. The Lord's going to show you how. Be with us each night. Bring your friends. I don't know where we'll put them, but bring them. That's a good problem to have, isn't it? Let's, let's give Elaton a real headache. Just bring so many people that just uh, everywhere. When I preached in South Africa, it was no problem. Everywhere I went, three, 4,000 people, they sat in the aisles. They sat on each other. They sat all around the stage. I would pick my way between them as I would preach. That's a good problem to have. So bring your friends. Go back and get your family. You ought to be at camp meeting anyway. <laughs> Man, this thing's closing up. Don't fiddle around over in Auckland when you could be out here on holy ground and sharing with your brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. So go back and get them if you left them home and bring them out here. And especially bring the one that doesn't want to come. <laughs> we really got something for him. Amen. Amen. And, and, and go and get the one you haven't seen at church for a while. Something's going to happen out here this week that's going to revive his soul. And he's going to see the old way marks and he's going to be encouraged to get back in the ship. So go get those backsliders and those ones that are kind of fringe Christians. Amen. And bring your mean wife. <laughs> and your disgruntled husband. <laughs> you have no authority to beat them up, but I do. Bring them out here. <laughs> I have a feeling... We're going to have a good time here this week. The Spirit of God is already here. He has been traipsing up and down these grounds and preparing it for us. He has set the stage. He is ready to go into action. He's ready to invade our hearts. But you've got to get near the thing for it to happen. Amen. I look forward to seeing all of you. Well, I need to get into today's message and uh, share with you. Thank God for the rain. Is that rain? Praise God. It keeps everybody inside. Isn't that wonderful? 
Thank the Lord for the rain. Do that right now. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Isn't that wonderful? All right. <laughs> now let us go to our text for today. Genesis, the sixth chapter. Genesis, the sixth chapter. I'll be sharing with you the first eight verses of Genesis 6. Amen. Well, that's going to be a good rain too, isn't it? Amen. I understood coming out here yesterday that you need rain. So please don't be like Americans. Don't complain. When it rains, we complain. We want it to stop. And when it stops, we complain because we want rain. Don't be that way. Thank the Lord for what he sends. Amen. And now I'm ready to share with you if you will follow along in Genesis, the sixth chapter. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eye of the Lord. Our message today, conquering circumstances, conquering circumstances. Let us pray. Almighty oh, God, here we are on your holy day, on your holy ground, with your holy people. We need your holy inspiration and divine instruction. Come, Lord, fill us, I pray, with thy spirit. And while you minister to this waiting congregation, Father, please don't pass me by. In the name of Jesus, I beg it. Amen. Conquering circumstances. Find ourselves in all kinds of circumstances, and some of them are not of our making, and yet we are caught up in them. I feel that Jesus has some answers. As a matter of fact, Jesus is the answer to every perplexing problem. Will you say amen? amen. Many modern Christians are spiritually tired. They feel that the world's problems are so great that they can have no realistic impact on the world. Because of life's circumstances, they're willing to simply exist. The Bible's statements concerning victory and triumph and conquest mean very little to these folk. It seems like foolish dreams to them. And yet they have a desire 
deep down in their souls to be able to conquer the perplexing circumstances that control them. Noah is one of the best known Old Testament characters because his name is eternally linked with the greatest catastrophe ever known to mankind, the flood. In the midst of trying circumstances, he was able to triumph. From his conquest, we can learn some truths that we need to follow in order to conquer circumstances right here in our day and time. We will look to the word for those instructions. Let me suggest to you first off that in order to conquer circumstances, we need to be true to the Lord's teachings. True to the Lord's teachings. I would suggest to you that you first make sure that the teachings are the Lord's and then be true to them. Because we have a tendency to teach for doctrine the commandments of men. You want to make sure that you divide truth away from error and then follow what is true. The malignant growth of humanity's sin seemed to be so widespread that it had gone unchecked for a long time, sort of like the world we're living in now. I think about my home country, which I love very much. But in the United States, there's a kind of a phenomenon now that no one has to be responsible for their own actions. If uh, something goes wrong, you can always blame your mother or your father or friends or relatives or the neighborhood you were raised in, anybody but yourself. And I believe that at this particular time in Noah's day that God got fed up with it. Like he's getting fed up now. And he decided to put an end to it. There was one person, however, who was righteous, and that was Noah. He was sort of a light in the midst of darkness. He, he was an oasis of truth in the midst of a desert of error and sin. And God called upon him. Noah followed the Lord of his own free will. I like that. Follow the Lord's teachings. It was not one of those circumstances where the Lord says, do what I say or else. Noah chose to follow the Lord. And I think most of you did too. Amen. Every now and then you run into a preacher that tried to browbeat you into this church. But I think most of you made your own decision under the urging of the Holy Spirit. I used to be one of those preachers, Pastor Towden. When I first came out of the seminary, I preached to hell and brimstone, and I would just punch people out with the truth. You know? Don't eat any more pork chops. Pow! Don't drink any alcohol. Pow! That's right. You better not work on the Sabbath. Pow, pow! And pretty soon they would say, Oh, don't hit me anymore. I'll join. Praise the Lord, I think I've found a better way. Share the truth of Jesus Christ. It will affect somebody. It may not get everybody, but it will get those that are searching for his truth. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was willing to enjoy the privileges and also to accept the responsibilities that went with his choice of following the teachings of the Lord. We often see people who appear to be getting along just fine, don't we? And they're not following truth. I mean, they have nice jobs, they, have, they drive nice automobiles, they have lovely homes, and they dress in the finest clothing, and yet they, they seem to have no knowledge of the Lord and certainly no acceptance of his truth, and kind of makes you wonder. Well, for 119 years and 364 days, the Lord's teachings didn't seem important to anyone in Noah's society but Noah. But he preached on anyhow. 
But as Jesus has said, what does it profit a man if he has gained the whole world and loses his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I think that we discover, looking at the life of Noah, that it's more important to follow God. What do you say? And so the Lord called upon Noah and began to talk with him in this same chapter uh, 6 of Genesis. And he spoke to Noah and he said, Make thee an ark of gopher wood, verse 14. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. That's about 450 feet. Amen. The breadth of it, 50 cubits, about 75 feet. And the height of it, 30 cubits, about 45 feet. And a window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. Don't forget that. The window was in the top. I'll come back to that later. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. This was a triplex. Amen. Three stories. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. Now, not only did Noah decide to conquer his circumstances by following the Lord's teachings, he also decided to conquer circumstances by following the Lord's leadership. You see, God is always going somewhere, and it behooves us to find out where it is by the study of his word so that we might follow him. Now, there are folk following all kinds of people in this world. I think of the Jim Joneses and the people like that. They have a, a, a host of folk that will follow them and follow them even to destruction. But God's got a better way. And if we can learn what Noah learned early, just to follow the Lord, as the Sabbath school teacher said this morning, even if it doesn't make sense, <laughs> it doesn't have to make sense, you know, because God is all sense and we are senseless. So it doesn't have to make sense to us. We just follow anyhow. Now I can imagine this was quite a challenge for Noah. God's telling him to build something that's never been built before and he's going to destroy the earth with something that's never happened before because they didn't have rain in Noah's day like we're getting today. The ground used to be watered by the dew that would fall overnight and it was enough because you see everything in God's creation was in perfect order. We're all out of control now so we either get a flood, amen, <laughs> or we get a drought. Things are out of control now because of sin, but God had it in perfect order. So it seemed totally in Congress that this thing could happen. But Noah believed God. And if you're going to conquer the circumstances in your life, you're going to have to sign on and believe God. So he began to build. Just the way God told him to build it had his blueprints out, had his boys with him, and they began to saw and hammer gopher wood. And folk began to wander by. Hey, Noah, what you working on? Oh, I'm building an ark. A what? An ark. Noah, what's an ark? Well, oh, Ellen White can tell you what an ark is. Let me show you what she says it is. Would you be interested? I'm going to tell you anyway. She has a very good description of what this thing is. Uh, she says, uh, God gave Noah, this is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 92, the exact dimensions of the ark and explicit directions in regard to its construction in every particular. Human wisdom could not have devised a structure of so great strength and durability. God was the designer and Noah the master builder. It was constructed like the hull of a ship that it might float upon the water, but in some respects it more nearly resembled a house. It was three stories high with but one door which was in the side. The light was admitted at the top and the different apartments were so arranged that all of them were lighted. We call that central lighting. The apartments were all built in this ark, three stories deep, 
so that this one window gave light to everybody's apartment and every animal's stall. Isn't that miraculous? But you see, God is very thorough. He does things in a miraculous way. Things that are impossible for us are a mere snap of thought for God. And so he directed this. But it still was occasion for people to make fun. You see, Ellen White goes on to say that folk in Noah's day were highly intellectual. They were brainy. They knew a lot. And they tried to use scientific reasoning to dispel this prophecy of a coming flood. They tried to show by scientific reasoning. Well, that's pretty reasonable. It had never rained before. So what makes you think it'll rain enough to float this monstrosity that you're building? To destroy every living thing? How ridiculous could a sermon be? I've had to preach some sermons that seemed ridiculous. I've had to tell people that in the end of time, God once again is going to destroy this earth, but by fire next time. And you know what? They're still scoffing, just as they were in Noah's day. Hey, Noah, tell us a little bit more about this boat now. It's going to float on the water, you say? Who's going to be in the boat, Noah? Well, everyone that will respond to the Lord's pleading can go on board. Oh, yeah, right, Noah. And he worked on 119 years, 350, 60, 64 days. They had parties outside the ship. They called their friends together to hoop and to poke fun. And then one day a strange thing happened. Someone noticed that out of the woods and out of the forest came the animals in perfect order marching toward this ship. Two by two came the clean animals and uh, the, the unclean animals and seven by seven came the clean animals. Each one coming in order and they'd never seen animals in such perfect order. You see, God is not the God of confusion, amen? And when he gives a command, even the elements will obey him. As a matter of fact, my Christian friends, we are the only thing that's out of control in God's universe. We're the only ones that don't obey him. Geese know to fly south in America right on schedule, and they know what time to fly back to Canada. But we don't have enough sense to come in out of the rain. No offense to you folk that are wandering around outside. And they marched into the ark, each one to his respective place. I don't think the stalls were named, do you? Giraffes, lion, tiger, elephant. No, it's not needed when there's harmony in what God is doing. <laughs> and yet we will argue over the most minute detail, won't we? I don't see anything wrong with going to movies. I don't see anything wrong with dancing. I don't see anything wrong with uh, taking a little snort every now and then. I don't see anything wrong with uh, two or three wives. So we have to have everything labeled because we're so out of control. Amen. But those animals marched into the, to the ark in perfect order, each finding its place. And then another strange thing happened. An angel from glory came down and shut the door. You see, Noah was a lot like preachers today, Pastor Town, and he probably would have still been preaching with the door open, hoping somebody would come. And God knows better than that, and so he's dispatched an angel from heaven, and he said, go down and shut the door. Probation is closed. Time to make decision is passed. Shut it. And that huge door began to swing on its hinges and slam shut with a finality. And then the people really began to rage. Oh, they made fun of Noah. They had barbecues. They had all kind of parties outside. Huh? You know about the Barbie down here, don't you? Sure. 
And, and they just had a great time. Hey, Noah, how's it feeling there? Ellen White says they sat there for a week. She said the sun rose every morning and set every evening. Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to know that was miserable, locked up with a bunch of elephants for seven days with the sun shining hot. Woo, I can't hardly stand the circus for seven hours, isn't that right? Huh, you got to get out and get some fresh air. But Noah was in there with his whole family. And it's important for you to understand that Noah's sons were in that ark with him, not simply because Noah was a good man. Oh, I need to make this point before I go on. Because there's a whole lot of people that still are living with grandma's religion. And they think somehow because grandma was good, God's going to save them. Let me show you something. Amen? You, you with me still? All right. The Signs of the Times. This is an article written by Ellen White, March the 27th, way back in 1879. Listen to what she said. The Lord said of Noah, who with his family was saved in the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Because Noah's sons were righteous, they were preserved in the ark with their father. Just wanted to clear that up, because a lot of people think Noah's sons were saved because Noah was nice. You're not going into God's kingdom because you got a good mother. Hello? You can't go out and do everything you're big enough today and think that your father's religion is going to save you. God is dealing with us as individuals. Would you say amen today? And he knows each one of us individually. He is well acquainted with us. He's one of those that you cannot pull the wool over his eyes. You cannot give God a soft story. He knows you intimately. And so those boys went into the ark because God had dealt with them as individuals and wanted to save them because they wanted to follow him. I don't know when it was or what time of day, but as the people raged and made fun, someone was hit in the forehead with a drop of rain. That must have been some experience. Can't you imagine them turning to the guy next, hey, did you feel that? Feel what? What is this? Wait, I got one too. And the next, and the next, hey, what is this? What is this? Taste it. No taste. It's water. Just a sprinkle. Just a little bit. And then a little more. And then a little more. And then it began to get muddy. And they tried to wipe their feet. And they couldn't wipe it off. And now it's coming in a downpour. And someone said, this is rain. Noah? Hey, Noah! Open the door. Uh, Noah, we changed our mind. See, some people try to do that, won't they? But remember, God's angel shut the door. And Ellen White says very specifically that Noah could not open the door. Praise God. Because I know he'd have been in there trying. There's old Aunt Harriet out there. She's changed her mind. Let's take her on. There was no salvation after probation. The door was shut tight. And the downpour came. And the people pleaded. And they pleaded even stronger when the water was up around their knees. You can imagine their terror when it became waist deep. And Ellen White says they began to tie their young onto the backs of animals and whip them into the mountains, hoping to escape the flood that God was sending. Terror reigned on the earth. People were struggling and screaming, trying to find some kind of rescue. And slowly, that old boat began to creak. You could hear it creaking and writhing. And then it broke free from the earth and was floating. Well, you know the story. I'm not going to give you the whole story of Noah. Kind of good to review it, though, isn't it? Huh? Kind of good to review it, even from the circumstance of letting you know that God gives a lot of warning before he brings destruction. 
And he's busy warning the earth now, and he should be warning them through us. Amen. Each of us has a commission to go and tell it. But Noah, in this time, overcame the circumstances that he found himself in simply because he was willing to listen to the teachings of God and follow him. And thirdly, he was able to look past his problems and see God. Now here's the good part. I love this part. That boat is floating. It's on top of the earth. And the waters, 40 days and 40 nights, the old Negro spiritual said, it rained without stopping. Noah was praying, but the rain wouldn't stop dropping. I don't imagine those were the best circumstances inside the boat. Huh? No hot running water. No cushy mattress. Not the best of food. But there was endurance there. And praise God, the only place you could look out to get any indications of the outside world was by looking up. Hallelujah. God, in his forethought, put the window in the top so that when things really got tough, and Noah and his family wanted to look somewhere. The only place to look was to God. And they looked above. They looked past their circumstances to the delivering God of heaven. And that's where they received their courage. Ellen White says he could open the window, but he couldn't open the door. And so the only place that Noah could find openness to the world was on the side where God was. Oh, there's a lesson for us there, isn't there? We will always be looking up toward our Redeemer, toward the rescuer of our souls. We are looking at all kinds of things in this world, but we are neglecting to look at God. You remember he sent out a raven. The Bible says the raven just flew back and forth, didn't know where to go. After a while, he sent out a dove. Dove went out, couldn't find anything, came back. Later on, he sent another one, isn't that right? This time came back with an olive branch, and it was hope. There was rejoicing on board that ship. I can imagine there was even, even an excitement among the animals. Rescue is near. Ellen says that old boat ground into a halt there on Mount Ararat, Ararat and stopped as the waters receded. And then God sent that same angel to come and open the door. And through him gave instruction to Noah, now you can go forth. I know today that there are circumstances in many of our lives that have us perplexed, even discouraged, even wondering what to do. There are people about you who ridicule you and make fun. You know, you're still a strange group of people. You recognize that, don't you? You're a strange bunch going to church on Saturday when everybody else is going Sunday. You eat funny. Amen. You dress funny. Some of you. Some of you look just like the world, so, you know, you're not having any problem with that part, right? No ridicule there because you look just like them. I can say this because I'll be on a plane in a week. Hey, man. Hey, look now. Look, you know, I'm not going to beat you up today. Don't worry about that. But if I don't give warning that I'm not as good a preacher as Noah. I want to be a little better preacher than Noah. He only got eight souls and there was his own family. Amen. So I got to tell you, but I'll tell you in a sweet way, be like Jesus. Get close to him. Study his will and his word and get in harmony with him. And it should be so that you not look weird but that you look so happy and so fulfilled that when people come in contact with you, they ought to want what you got. And if they don't want what you got, it means what you got is worth having. Amen. I was standing preaching in Johannesburg, South Africa. 
You know, we have to be careful in witnessing. Always tell the truth, amen? And I was preaching one night at the close of my meeting. The place was packed. They had a small hall there, and they had crowded 1,200 people into that place. And they were standing in the, in the aisles and sitting in the windowsills, and the fire marshal just turned his back because it was an impossible situation. And I was preaching that night about circumstances, and I talked about the fact that God is able to deliver us out of our circumstances. He can even deliver a drunk and an alcoholic if he wants to be rescued. You know, you get wound up and you really start preaching. Well, I believe what I was saying. But more importantly than that, someone in the audience believed me. And bless your heart, a man stood up in the back and began to make his way down the aisle, and he was reeling, obviously under the influence of a different spirit. <laughs> and I had trained my security people, don't let anyone get near the stage. Amen. Head them off. That's smart, isn't it? Head them off before they get to the stage. I was on the stage. And he came down. But I was impressed as I saw him coming, Lyle, to say to my security, brethren, let him through. And he came down, I'll never forget it, to the edge of the stage. Show you the power of God to get through. Circumstances. And he looked up at me from the floor there where he was standing and he said, can Jesus really set me free? And there was my challenge. There was my challenge, Rain. Put up or shut up. Practice what you preach. If you believe it, stay with it. If you don't, you got no business preaching it. Amen? I looked him straight in those bleary eyes and I said, yes, Jesus can rescue you if you want to be rescued. He began to cry. I've seen drunks cry before. But this was a different thing. He fell on his knees and grabbed me around my knees. I pulled him up and embraced him. And we stood there together and I began to pray for him. Deliverance from the circumstances of his life. Found out later that his wife, his family, everyone had left him because of his circumstances. Brothers and sisters, much to my amazement, and I believe, he stepped back and shook my hand and praised God and walked back to his seat totally sober. Now, there's another challenge for me. <laughs> he said, I want this Jesus you got. So I want to be baptized. Huh? Doesn't that excite you? We had a drunk just a few moments ago, and now he, he wants Jesus in his life. He wants to be baptized. God was ready, but you know we weren't, don't you? No, we weren't ready because you know what we have to do. Amen? You've got to give you 27 weeks of studies, right? We've got 27 points of doctrine and give you one point every week, right? You keep you coming back. If you've got endurance, you can get in the Adventist church. You've got to have endurance to get in this church. Not faith, endurance! Good thing we weren't back here today at the Pentecost. We wouldn't let any of those 3,000 people be baptized, would we? <laughs> and you know what we do, don't you? You know what we do with that. We try to make excuses. We say, well, they were all kind of half Adventists anyway. It doesn't matter what has you gripped this morning. It doesn't matter what has hold of you this, this morning, what has derailed you. God has the power to overcome it. He can conquer the circumstances of your life if you are willing to surrender yourself to him. I don't know. Noah's family was saved. How about you and yours? Are you ready? Are you willing to accept the teachings of the Lord? To follow his direction? Huh? Are you ready to do that? I mean fully. Not picking out the things you like and neglecting the things you don't like. 
but total surrender and commitment to the Lord. Are you ready for that? Now you would think that preacher coming here from America would look out in this audience today and say, hey, everybody here is already an Adventist, so shut up and go eat. But I know better. It takes more than just being an Adventist. Sabbath school lesson should have reminded you of that this morning. It takes more than knowing what the doctrines are. What I wonder about this morning is how closely are you following Jesus? Is he a constant companion of yours? Are you personal friends on a first name basis? Can you call him Jesus and he call you by your first name? Do you know him that well? Do you have that kind of relationship with him? If you do, great. If you don't, he wants you to have it. And the good news is you can have it before you leave this tent today. Isn't that good? And I can say that with authority. I don't have to apologize and I don't have to back into it. I can step up boldly and say, you too can have this deliverance. I don't even have to say, Lord, if it's your will, it is his will to save you. It is his declared will to rescue you. It is his desire to forgive you. It is his purpose to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's what he wants to do. The only hold up, the only glitch, the only cog in the wheel, you. You've got to make that decision, Lord. I'm ready for the rescue. I'm ready to renew my walk with you. I'm ready to reestablish my relationship with you. You can conquer the circumstances through the power of Jesus. Somebody here today feels a desperate need for what Jesus has to offer. And in this big tent, with all this big crowd around you, I want to invite you to come and get it. He has it for you. If you really feel a need, if you really want to feel the emptiness that is in your heart and in your soul, I know that I need him. So I'm always first in my calls. No one can beat me to the altar because I'm first. I need him more than all men. I want him in my life. But I'm willing also to surrender and give myself to him. How about you? Is there somebody in this audience today who wants that experience with Jesus? Whatever your circumstances are, you're willing to turn them over to him today and let him be the conqueror. If you're here today and you really need him, come and join me here and let's pray about it before we go to lunch. Okay? Who are you? You need him. You want him. He's true to his word. He's ready to respond to you. But you've got to move. He's not going to wrestle you to the ground. He's not going to drive you. But he will lead you. Praise God. Look at these coming. They're saying, yes. Yes, Jesus. Yes, me. I've come to this camp meeting, and I don't want to go home the same way that I came. I want a change in my life. I want things to be different. It can be different. Right now, look at them come. Yes. How about you? How about you? What are your circumstances? I don't know them, and they're not my business, but God knows them, and he's ready to go into action for you, but you've got to come toward him. God bless you. You're still coming. Now give me some music. And they're going to come while you render this music. Continue to come. And we're going to pray a special prayer of deliverance. Conquerors through Jesus. It's real, my friend. It's real. You'll be here tonight, and I'll be able to tell you some of the things that God has conquered in my life. That's how I'm able to stand before you today as a minister of the gospel, because Jesus is able to conquer circumstances. Otherwise, I'd be out there somewhere lost, if not dead. But praise God, because of his love and his ability to conquer, I'm here. God bless you. Still coming. Still coming. Come on, I see you. Come on. Yes, join us in this prayer. God's anxious to bless you because you want to be. He's got the power. 
Yes. There is something about that name. Come. 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 You've been wrestling with something that just about has you whipped. Bring it down today. Let's leave it here. Okay? Don't take it back home. You got a chance to get rid of it. Finally. Somebody in your life that's not here wouldn't come if they had a chance. Come down and represent them today. Amen. You got some wayward child, some some loved one that's out of control. They wouldn't come to a camp meeting. If you threaten them, they wouldn't come. But you are here and it's no accident. Come down and represent them. Present them to the Lord right now. Do you believe in that? Sure. Don't you believe you can come and pray for them right here at the altar? Yes, you can. Bring the problem. Bring the circumstance, whatever it is. You're struggling with a job or maybe you're struggling without a job. <laughs> you know, God, God has all the jobs. Gold and the silver is mine. He says the cattle on a thousand hills is mine. If I was hungry, I wouldn't even tell you. That's the God I want to recommend to you today. Come. Give him the circumstance. Give him the problem. Some of you want to stand out there where you are. Just stand right up. God bless you. Yes, I see that response. Stand right up where you are. That's fine. Yes. Stand right up. Yes. God bless you. I see that. You're saying, I just want the Lord to be strong in my life. Overcome whatever circumstances I'm facing now. You got a decision to make? A heavy, important decision? You wouldn't want to make it without the Lord, would you? Stand up now. Give it to him. Let him tell you what to do about it. He's got the answer. <laughs> no question about it. And he is never perplexed. He is never at a loss. He doesn't know anything about emergencies because he's always prepared. Thank God. This is beautiful. I'm going to pray for you now. And I want you to pray in your heart of whatever that need is. Present it to the Lord now with courage and with faith, believing that you have the answer in him. He will not forsake you. He will not disappoint you. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, thank you for being a conqueror of every vicissitude of life. Thank you, Lord, that you don't have to worry about what the circumstances are. Something as great as a world flood might perplex us, Lord, but it does no, it's no problem for you. You already have the answer worked out. And so we come today just as we are, and whatever the problems and whatever the circumstances in our lives, we come and stand before you now, Lord, and present ourselves. We ask you, merciful Father, to forgive us, to cleanse us, to correct us, to reprove us, to strengthen us, to lead us. Oh, Lord, it's just like you to love us. And I'm so thankful that your love is unconditional. You don't love us just when we're good and hate us when we're bad. You love us all the time. Thank you for that. Now, Lord, we've brought some problems here. Some of them are beyond our scope of understanding, but we've got them and we brought them. We brought them trusting you, and it is our fullest intent to leave them here at the altar. We are not going to bag up these problems and sling them over our shoulders when we leave. We're going to leave them here at the foot of your cross. And, Lord, we ask you now to go for us and go before us and go and intercede. Some people standing here, Lord, need you to go to their homes now and intercede for them because they left somebody there that's not right. They're out of harmony, and they've had a great experience here, but when they get back home, it's going to be hell to pay all over again. So, Lord, I ask you to go ahead of them and prepare the way. You can touch hearts. You can change circumstances. And I ask you to do that, Lord. Give some dear soul peace that's been struggling for such a long time. Someone stands here, Lord, because they're worried about a physical ailment. They've struggled with it. And doctors and everyone else has tried and nothing can happen. Lord, you can bring relief. You do these things better than anything else. Miracle is your way of life. I pray, Lord, you grant a miracle to those, to those that reach out to you today in faith. Heal some home, Lord. 
please. Some child is at odds with his parents and it's broken their hearts. Help them, Lord, to learn to love unconditionally the way you have. That they can love that child even though he's not doing what they want. And through that love to break down the barriers of hate and win them back. Oh, Lord, I don't want to multiply words. And I surely don't propose to tell you what to do because you know what to do in every circumstance and every situation. So, Lord, here we are. Please take us and do for us that which we so desperately need. And, Lord, when you're finished, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. We'll not be shy to tell somebody that our God has delivered. We'll be happy to share the good news. The Lord on our side. Bless us, keep us, and save us is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand right where you are. I want you to join with us. We're going to sing a prayer that you all know so very well. Lyle and the singers are going to lead us in it. And I want you to sing this out of your very delivered soul today. A heart that has been set free and encouraged and lifted up ought to be able to sing this prayer with much feeling. Do that now, please. <laughs>